I'm from Prestonsburg. I'm a lawyer. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my experience as a Holocaust survivor. There is a book called This is Home Now, which I'm going to give to the library that was written. Uh, that tells the stories of about the 12, I think 11 or 12 other survivors who are from Kentucky. The book was written by a woman named Arvin Donahue, who uh, lives, is a farmer actually now, and who worked in the Holocaust Museum in Washington, and then she was interested in, in uh, finding out what folks were doing, Holocaust survivors who were not living necessarily in large urban areas like New York or Philadelphia. She found about 20, I think, in Kentucky. Uh, and so she interviewed someone who didn't want to be interviewed, but there were about 11 or 12 interviews. Most of them, many of those folks have been through the camps and have had pretty difficult times, but uh, if you have a chance, I'm going to leave this copy for your library, but in the new library probably by the time you get to it. Um, just a word or two, I came to Eastern Kentucky in 1970, which is now almost 50 years ago. We came for a couple of years, but I came to help start a program for people who need lawyers in Canada for it. It's called Appalachian Research and Defense Fund. The acronym that's app, people know it as Apple Red. The, uh, the main, the main uh, office is in Prestonsburg, which is where we live. Uh, there's five other offices through Eastern Kentucky and uh, Richmond. Now we have as many as 11 years ago, but the funding has been difficult over the years. But the offices there's one in Hazard and there's one in Richmond, there's one in Somerset, and. Uh, there's a smaller office, an intake office in Pikeville and Martin County. We have a lot of clients from Martin County. They're uh, served by the Prestonsburg office. So the point that those those are if you have a situation where someone needs a lawyer and can't afford them in a civil case, that is to say family law, consumer problems, who are in danger of having their house foreclosed, uh, someone who has gotten over their head, because of a bad contract, and they bought a used car that didn't work, or an eviction case where folks are renting a house that may not be in good shape, and they've been given notice to leave, they need a lawyer in public or private housing, and then uh, Social Security, SSI cases, cases for welfare, food stamps, Medicaid cases where those someone's applied and did not get those benefits. So those lawyers are available to do that. And Apple Red has a website, you can apply, a family can apply. We have a lot of family law issues, a lot of custody problems uh, that come along. Uh, and things like education, making sure that schools are uh, providing services to folks who are children who have disabilities. Huge area back in the earlier days before our schools improved. So those they're available. And you can look it up on the website, and uh, we want people to know about those services because a lot of times people don't, or don't realize the problem they've got is a legal problem, and when they realize it's a legal problem, they don't know they can get a lawyer without paying for one if they are low income. So just wanted you to know that. I don't have any handouts for it, but you can look it up on the web or if you have our savvy technology. So this morning I want to talk to you a little bit about, or at least Jimmy's asked me to talk about my experience as a Holocaust survivor. Uh, I was born in a town called Magdeburg, Germany, which is a, a large industrial center about 60 miles from Berlin. You can find it on the map. And uh, I have here a very rough map, which I need to improve over time. But it will give you an idea in your history class and all of you know something about world history, where countries are. So this is uh, roughly the, uh, the map of Germany, the France, Belgium, Netherlands, Poland, Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic, and Austria. So uh, Magdeburg is here near Berlin. And the other town I've, uh, the, the, the couple of others that I've noted, this little town up near Leer, L-E-E-R, near the Dutch border. That's where my father was born and his family. And the 
this little town here is E.R. Oberstein's two names. That's where my mother was, uh, grew up. And uh, so I, uh, I'm going to show you a few photographs of, of that, of their family, or primarily of my father's family, uh, because <coughs> as a result of the Holocaust, many of them were not able to get out, and many of them were killed. It's important to remember those of you who have all of you who have family, and those are very close in Eastern Kentucky when we lose folks along the way for reasons for simply because they happen to be Jewish, which is what happened in Germany, of course. Uh, it's something we, we certainly want to avoid in the future. So uh, I have here.
my dad joined them at dinner and took these meals here, so he got to know my mother very well. And so when she turned 18 or so, they got married. And by then, he had a new assignment in Magdeburg. He got a job, a little better job, and they moved into a suburban area called Krakow. And that's where I was born. It was a little garden apartment. Back then, it was sort of one of the nicer, newer areas of that community. My father took a bike, he used to bicycle to work, and uh, he uh, and he assisted the rabbi in the community. I'm going to stop for just a minute because I don't know how many of you have met uh, folks who are Jewish in your in your school today. How many of you have ever had a Jewish friend? Anybody in this group? Your teachers. <laughs> you. <laughs> So uh, you should uh, let we'll just stop for a second so that you uh, have some idea that uh, your teacher, Mr. Horn, has been with us to the Congress to Huntington, the nearest Jewish synagogue. The place of worship is in Huntington, West Virginia. There are about 13,000 Jews, by the way, in Kentucky, maybe a few more now. There are several congregations in Lexington and in, and in Louisville, not many Jews in eastern Kentucky, although we had in Williamson, West Virginia, which isn't that far from here, we have a fairly large congregation, especially in the 30s and 40s during the uh, cold moon years, and there were quite a few Jews who came in. Uh, primarily, they became shop owners. They came down here initially, as uh, many of the Jews who came to the United States, a lot of them were in New York, and uh, those who left New York uh, were peddlers often. They came with a truck full of stuff and went from city to city, from community to community, selling uh, their wares. And then during the war, many of them opened stores, as they did in Williamson. But there were probably, uh, the congregation had about 75, I think 75 families who were in Williamson. There are very few left now actually close that synagogue down. But, so if you go to the synagogue in Huntington, as Mr. Horn did, it's a very old, large building. And Jews, the, basically the tenets of Judaism were the Old Testament. Jesus, as you probably know, was Jewish, right? Back then, primary religion at the time was in those period was Jewish. And, and then Jesus added over time in his disciples who had the New Testament. So Judaism is founded on the Old Testament and, a, and some books that were written following the Old Testament that sort of define and give some more meaning to the way Judaism is carried out. And so the point is, some say it's the oldest monotheistic, it's the oldest religion in the world that where folks believe in one God, we believe in God. And so and that's from that, the New Testament followed afterwards. So here, as Mr. Horn came up to our uh, services are open. They're usually Friday nights and Saturdays. Uh, traditionally, the day of rest, the Sabbath is Saturday, not Sunday. And if you go into areas where there are, like in some areas in New York City, where you have a, a very uh, strict religion, which is called Orthodox, you'll find that everything is closed, as it is if you go to Israel, which once was Palestine, things are closed on Saturday. Saturday it's not Sunday. Saturday is Sunday. It's the, it's the day of rest. And so, uh, but that, uh, if, you, if you're in Lexington, the, any of those congregations, those services are open. There's nothing secret about them. Um, and uh, you can, your Sunday school class or your church is welcome. We have many church groups that come to services. Uh, and when I was growing up in North Carolina, we used to have the church groups all that came over all the time. So uh, getting back, so that's where we were. And so um, my, my grandfather, my mother's father, and many other Jewish men actually fought for Germany uh, during the First World War. Pretty hard to understand that then that when Hitler came to power in 1931 to 33, and 
over the next few years really started this period of absolute hatred of Jews and blaming Jews for all of the economic problems and any problems that Germany had were they were really designated as the scapegoat. And so during the 1930s, gradually from 35, from maybe 1933, 1938, Jewish men could no longer practice their professions. The lawyers couldn't be lawyers. Doctors were not allowed to be doctors. And you've probably seen pictures of signs of the window. They have signs on the window saying, don't, don't uh, purchase from this Jewish merchant. And life became pretty difficult. And you can imagine that if, uh, if your grandfather, if you have a picture in your house, if you fought for Germany, or if you fought for this country during the Vietnam or Korea during any war, it's almost inconceivable to think that here you were in the military and you fought to make this for this country, but all of a sudden the tables are going to be turned. If they say, well, we don't need to we hate you. Even though you fought for us, you're not worth anything. You're worthless. And life became really very, very difficult. So people did start leaving. In fact, some families put their children, got their children out of Germany on something called a Kinderlift. Kinder is a German word for children. And they started sending some of those children to this country and to England and to get the families wanting to get their kids out even if they couldn't get out themselves. Now, a little more of a story to tell you about that a little, bit, a little later. But so some folks saw the writing on the wall, life became so difficult, they said there was no reason for us to stay in Germany anymore. And many others thought, well, you know, this is Germany, this is my religion, this is my country, I'm going to stay here because it's not going to get, this thing has got to, going to end. And that's what we think about today with these alt-right groups. You don't want to see anything. Some of these crazies, <clears throat> these folks who, these guys who, in Charlottesville stuff last year, people who have swastikas, who are white, Aryan, white Aryans and who are sort of promoting this, uh, this message in this country, uh, they seem like very small groups here and there. We've got to make sure they may have their, we have freedom of speech in this country, but we don't want <clears throat> what happened in Germany to happen in this country. And all of us are saying, well, it can't happen here. You know, we had that alt-right group in Pikeville a couple of years ago, we had a rally and they came, and we let them talk, and they yelled back and forth. <clears throat> we just had the shooting out in California. Somebody crazy shooting killed a woman in front of the synagogue and two or three people were hurt. We had this terrible incident in Pittsburgh recently. These are the kinds of things we don't want to see happen. But in Germany, you had an entire population beginning to believe what Hitler was telling them. And he did not see military got bigger and bigger. <clears throat> people are have this nationalistic spirit. And so it all sort of that's not our uh, so, uh, all of the, uh, the height of it came on November 9th, 1938, night called Crystal Night, Crystal Night, Crystal Night, the night of broken glass. What happened that evening was that the Nazis went virtually to every synagogue in, throughout Germany, virtually every synagogue throughout Germany, and burned the synagogue down. So by that point, at that time, uh, I was seven to eight years old, and we were living in the building next to the synagogue. So during the night, about midnight or a little bit later, the, knocked on our door, and the Nazis came, and they brought us out into the courtyard of that, the big courtyard between the 
two buildings. It was kind of an L-shaped thing in the courtyard. I learned to ride a bike in the <clears throat> courtyard. And they brought us out into the courtyard. And then they went into the synagogue, into the sanctuary, and brought all the prayer books out. And then at the front of the sanctuary, when you go into almost any, any synagogue, you'll find there's a big ark there's sort of like a closet at the front of the synagogue, and in the closet are what we call the Torah. The Torahs are very large scrolls that have been handwritten calligraphy in Hebrew, and they're the Old Testament. So when the scroll is begins, almost all of it is on one side, and there's a little over here, and during the course of the year, each week, you read a different portion of that Old Testament. In Hebrew. It's kind of like going through a Sunday school lesson each each week and learning a and, and going through the New Testament. So these are handwritten scrolls. They have very beautiful covers and there's a silver plate and there's a silver pointer so that whoever is reading this calligraphy, which is kind of difficult to read, I can't, and, you know, I can recognize the letters most rabbis, the person leading the congregation will be able to read it and often to sing, to chant. Well, they brought those out into the courtyard and then they made a big bonfire. And during that bonfire, which we, while we were standing there watching and my brother was, at that time my mother was holding my brother, he was two years old, and she turned to one of these Nazis who was standing there with a gun and said, are you going to kill us? And <laughs> And he said he didn't know. He didn't, thank goodness. But they eventually let us go back upstairs into the apartment, and they pretty well torn everything up. And the next morning, they came back, and they came back, and they arrested my father. They picked him up. They didn't just knock on the door, and they just grabbed him. He was Jewish, so they, OK, you don't need a warrant. Just pick him up, take him with you. So they arrested about 125 men in this community. They brought them all to the local police station and put them in some cells, two or three cells that were jammed in together. They all thought they thought they were going to go home that night. They had no reason to think they were going to stay. But instead, they took them to the Buchenwald concentration camp. And so they were. They spent 17 days in the concentration camp. It was a pretty horrific time. My father really didn't like to talk about it very much. Basically, they gave him very little to eat, very little broth. They gave him, it was very difficult. Much of the time, all they did was stand around. And I don't know if you, if you can imagine how long you can stand still in one place. Uh, it's not easy. So during that time, some of the men went a little crazy and ran into the electrified fence. About 25 of those men were killed during that 17 years, or they didn't make it during that 17 days. This is the time when, and so when those 17 days were up, for whatever reason, my mother and other people that in our community were trying to go to the police station every day and were trying to let the message, please send our men home. They were trying to get them home. Whether that had anything to do with the fact that they were really let them out of the concentration camp or not, I'm not sure. They were, after 17 days, they were released. And they were given 30 days to get out of the country. And this was the, people always are asking me, well, I thought, well, they killed six million Jews, how did they let these folks get out? Well, this was sort of before they had finally decided, figured out how you're going to kill all the Jews, how we're going to transport them on trains and get them to get them to Poland, get them to the camps where they you know, where they were murdered. So at the very begin in this early period, they allowed some people to get out of the country if they were, if they could get out. And uh, in fact, I've said there was a plan. Somebody suggested if we get all the Jews out of the country. 
Do you know those that I gave top of the class invitations to? I need your information sheet turned in today, so please try to grab those by my office. So, uh, my mother had sent me, when, when they arrested my father uh, that day, actually, sort of small, and said my mother wanted them to wait so she could make him a sandwich. The guy waited around for a minute or two, and then he, he said, uh, then he took my father on, and my mom gave me the sandwich. They ran up there. I was an eight-year-old at the time. I told you, and I was seven, and ran down the street and, and brought my father the sandwich so he had something to eat. Uh, but during that period, my mom sent me to my aunt, who was one of the ladies on that picture that I showed you. She lived in Frankfurt with her husband, and they had a son my age named Google someone to play with. And my brother was two years old. She sent him to the house, to the apartment the family that had a, had a babysitter that used to live above us that she knew. And then because she, our apartment was really unlivable. So she spent the night with different people. And she sent my brother to that family. So after my, after the, uh, 17 days were up. My father and, my, and his brother, who had been, who had also been arrested, they got out and they came to Frankfurt first. Their heads had been shaved. And they talked about the difficulties they had, and then my father brought me back to Magdeburg. My 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 brother, and the family was reunited. He had one of the ladies whose pictures I showed you was living in Rotterdam, Holland. They had three children. His husband was a business person. And because of that connection, uh, I think my father had, a, had his passport and they were able to get on the train and go to Rotterdam. And so we were in this camp in Rotterdam and we spent, which was a, in a large building, the Dutch government, there were lots of Jews who, were, who had gone to Holland after all these synagogues had been burned and all this terrible situation for Jews all over Germany. Many of the people were, some had already tried to get out. So some of them were going to Holland, some were going to other countries. And the Dutch government then set aside some buildings so that people would have a place to live. And the one that we were sent to was a large overnight hostelry with the Holland America Line, which is still a cruise line today, uh, operated. And it had several floors. And one of those floors, I don't know what of you, if you had a, a nice cabin on the ship, you're going to leave the next day in your first class. You might have a nicer accommodation. And we we had a little cubicle that was with four bunk beds, two on one side for my mom and dad, and two on the other side for me and my brother. <clears throat> and during that period, the kids didn't have very much to do, so my father started a school. We didn't have a lot of text painting materials, but he started a school in that for the kids who were there. And, um, and we were in the camp, we were in that detention center. We could get away on weekends. In fact, my mom often, she would babysit for the family in Rotterdam so they, they could take a little vacation. Uh, so we were there, the women, the Jewish women, prepared meals. My dad made, uh, did such a good job with the school that the Dutch authorities uh, approached him, they were starting a new camp called Westerbork. And we, we've since been back to, some of us have been back to Westerbork. Westerbork became the big, wasn't, they didn't call it a concentration camp, they had another name for it, but what, what it was is they brought all the Jews in Holland to Westerbork, and then once a week, on a Tuesday, they, the 
train would leave from Westerbord and go to Auschwitz. And Auschwitz was where these folks were killed. Uh, they were gassed and they were put in the ovens and they were killed. So when the authorities said, they were, when they knew the dead had done such a good job and asked him to start the school in Westerbord, he had a premonition that if we enter, if we actually went to Westerbord, that was probably would have been the end for us. Why he had that premonition, I'm not sure. I mean, they, at the time, it really they hadn't started; they were just starting to put people there. But eventually, if you read anything about these, this period, it was very sad because the, the Jewish, they had, they designated designated a committee that had to figure out each week who was going to get on the train that was going to go that week. And that train would go to Auschwitz and those people would never would be killed at Auschwitz. So they had to pick these people out. How they did that, I'm not sure. Well, my dad had found out that there was a committee. There was a committee. There were so many people who wanted to get out of Holland at the time and so many people who wanted to leave who were in this detention camp center and others who wanted to get to the United States, there wasn't enough room. And someone had to figure out who goes and who doesn't go. Who, what, who are, what's the priority? And so it turned out that there, there, they had a committee from the Jewish Welfare Organization and the committee made the decision on who was going to be first and who, who would get on the ship the next time the ship left. And by, by a really a peculiar and timely circumstance, when my father heard about this committee and went and decided that he hadn't been asked to come, he hadn't been asked to go to the committee, he was running the school. They wanted him to stay, to keep running the school. And so he went down to see the committee. When he opened the door, when he knocked on the door, he said at the end of the day, he knocked on the door, and the fellow, and when he opened the door, somebody looked up at him and said, Rosenberg, what are you doing here? And it turned out that it was someone that he had known in Germany, whom he had helped raise money in the congregation where we lived. You know, somebody had come for fundraising, the churches with fundraising, the Jewish welfare system, they were looking for somebody to help them raise money, and somebody told them, go to Go, go see Mr. Rosenberg because he knows all the families of the community. And so they'd spent some time raising money together. It turned out that that fellow was the head of this committee. And so whether it was that particular moment or not, he would, we were able then to get on the, to the ship. Now it wasn't very, it wasn't an easy thing because in order to come to this country, and that still goes on today, if you're going to help a family from another country come in and live here, you have to sign a piece of paper that if they can't take care of themselves, that you will do that. Gene and I sponsored a young uh, girl from there three or three years ago. There was a college professor at Big Sandy who had some family, and you have to sign on the dotted line that you're going to take care of, but if they can't, can't find a job and can't take care of themselves, don't do that. Well, my my two, my father's two sisters who already come here, uh, they just started working. They didn't have any money. So you had to find a sponsor. That's what those people were called. Seniors, Miss Connie Harless needs your t-shirt money today, if possible. Miss Connie Harless needs senior t-shirt money today. All other t-shirt money needs to be into Miss Harless by Friday. So, get your t-shirt money. <laughs> so, um, so, one of my, one of his sisters was able to find a very distant relative, an architect in New York, who uh, was able to say he would sponsor us. After that, they got all, when that was done, we were able to get uh, really on the last, uh, virtually the last ship to leave Holland uh, and come to this country. And uh, while I was, we went on this big ship, there was a, 
I couldn't speak English yet, but one of the highlights of the trip was seeing the first American colorized movie, which was The Wizard of Oz. They showed The Wizard of Oz. And when we came to, when we landed in New Jersey, it was in New Jersey, in West Ellis Island, New York, all the flags were out. And we thought that was a wonderful welcome for us. But it turned out it was Washington's birthday, the President's Day. So that's why the flags were out. But then we went, uh, we lived, my dad was in, uh, we were in New York. We lived with my mother's family for a period of time in New York. And it was very difficult to find a job. My father learned that in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and Gastonia, North Carolina, there were two Jewish congregations that were looking for rabbis. He wasn't a rabbi, but he was trained as a religious school teacher, and he could, he could function. And so he went there, and uh, then he started sweeping floors in the textile, started from scratch. And so he saved up some money, and about six months was able to bring us buy some furniture on time. We lived in Spartanburg for several years. Now we moved to Gastonia, and you became the office manager of the textile plant. Please pardon the interruption, but all seniors need to have their senior quote turned into Mrs. Carroll today. It will not be accepted after today. So please write it down and turn it into Mr. Mrs. Carroll in the JRTC room. Thank you. So anyway, uh, and I grew up, spent most of my time growing up in Gastonia, North Carolina. Uh, I became president of my senior class. We're getting ready to have the 70th high school reunion. Can you imagine? So I'm older than you think. Maybe. But anyway, in any event, uh, we, had, we came to this country. And uh, it was quite a change, if you can imagine, moving someone. They, my mom and dad had lots of friends. They were living in Germany back then in the Jewish community. And all of a sudden, you're picked up and moved to a segregated society in uh, North Carolina. And how do you, you don't know, you're just starting from scratch. You don't know anything about baseball or football or whether you send your kids to somebody's home to a party. I started working after school. I started to live in the papers when I was 12. Term of the afternoon, but it was the, the point is we lived in a segregated society, which was pretty bad. I mean, segregation was very bad. But we were so glad to be in this country. Probably wouldn't matter what situation, where were they? Indian reservation or in segregation? It's only until I was in the service years later when we were in England. The service. The situ the, Military was the first group to really desegregate. And uh, one year, what hit me it was an incident when I was in the Air Force. I was a navigator. And we brought it. I was an officer. We brought a plane back from England to this country, and the radar operator was a fellow named Abe Jenkins, who was black. And we were both we brought this plane back to Long Island. We got on the train. We were going to go visit our families. He was from Charleston, South Carolina, and I was from Gastonia. We got on the train and we got to D.C. He said he would see me later. I said, well, we would see us in England. I said, well, where are you going? He said, I'm going to the back of the train with blacks. And so, I, you know, after all of those years, having grown up in North Carolina and having even do, I went to a school you've probably never heard of. It's called Duke University. Uh, not a popular school in this country. In Kentucky. But in any event, uh, that it was uh, it was pretty much a white university. But it, the, the fact that Abe was in a uniform and decided and he had to sit in the back probably uh, was something that I would like to see us change in the South. And so eventually, I became a lawyer and went to work for the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice in Washington for several working try to undo this caste system in the South. And uh, do a lot of legal work around issues of segregation and schools, employment, what have you, which I won't spend a lot of time on right now. So I'm just going to show you a couple more of these slides and then have the question that you have time to go. There are not many, uh, but I don't think they're 
this is just a, this is a telephone book. And my father went to Magdeburg and it says he can't really read it, but up here it says Lear Rosenberg, Lear, which is teacher. And it's a shoe shop, it's what I say, it's a shoe street in our apartment with the telephone number. And sometimes when people are want to deny that there was a Holocaust or this sort of thing happened, a picture of uh, my mom and me in a park, and my brother walking, having a nice afternoon, just like you or would do here. No way to believe that things were going to get as bad as they did. And, uh, in Germany, the first day of school is a big day. Uh, education is very important. And what happens, it's a real a celebratory day. And when you, many families do what my parents did, you get a cone of goodies. School supplies, candy, and things of that nature. And uh, so that the first day of school is a big day and you look forward to, that you look forward to and that school education is very important. Even then, when it's only for Jewish kids. My father and another poet started that. So this is the art. This, these are the drawers I was telling you about. It's a picture of the inside of art. And my father saved one or two, one of the little drawers with it, but they apparently did not run up. I don't know what which one this is. So this is the inside of the synagogue after they had dynamited it. Uh, they didn't burn the synagogue down, we were told, because there was a hospital next door, and they were afraid that if you built, if they torched the synagogue, uh, it would likely burn the hospital also. So this is the inside, the pictures were made by the Nazis themselves, and turned up later on in some research. Shine. This is the certificate of my father's release from Buchenwald concentration camp. And you can see it came in on 11 November, and then he was uh, left on the 27th. And there's a page on the back of it that said uh, he needed to immediately contact the police officials at Lockenberg. And then they said, there it is. Now, this is a, what Magdeburg itself looked like after the war. It had been pretty well obliterated by bombing raids. The spires, the cathedral was saved for some reason. When we were, we, when he and I were there, we took my mother back one year. And she, uh, there was a festival going on there, and they told us that there was actually an exhibit to the Jewish congregation in uh, Magdeburg, which we went to see. And in that exhibit... Attention seniors, any of you that are not going on the senior trip and are planning on just staying home for the next three days, they will be unexcused and it could go into your senior week activities. So, senior... You can ask them what uh, they... If, if they John? John? John, you, you really ought to pause and let them ask you any questions. All right, well, this is, I think this is the last one. So, do we, that's a good time. I think we're going to run out of time. So, who has a question? I'm sure I didn't cover it all. It's always a little bit hard to uh, get through this. So John, did that have the music wall? Did that have the music wall? Yes. Yes. And was that a whole thing you can't do again? No, the movement wall was a going wow. concentration. Mm -hmm. They killed people in the movement wall later on. Uh, he went from Buchenwald, he came out, and then he, uh, from there, we went to Holland. So once they were released, I do want to tell you that in those early pictures of the, in the family, uh, the family where I spent in Frankfurt, and I was with my dad's in Frankfurt, they were all killed. And the Frankfurt family was picked up and with the family in Holland. 
four children, three children, and one actually there was a baby born in Westerbork. They picked them up. My father's mother, who was in a little town called Methel, was in Holland. Picked her up. She was almost 70 at the time. She was killed. My father's brother was in the concentration camp. He was married in the concentration camp. And he was killed, and we saw his widow in Israel years later. But all in all, we think there were, there were like 14 people who were members of my family that were killed during that period. So six million Jews. So I always try to remember, if somebody came with the county judge or the governor said tomorrow, we're going to pick up all the, or the president said, we're going to pick up all the Baptists and put all the Baptists in a concentration camp. It's unthinkable, right? Unthinkable? So they picked up all the Jews. And over a period of years, six million. Six million Jews. And some gypsies and some others. Disabled people. Very sad. And there are, you know, you can find lots of books to read about this period. And there were also a period, I'm reading a book right now about a group in a small village in France, which was uh, where the local citizens hid Jews and kept them from being arrested. A whole small village. And the book, I just, I just got. There's several, there's a, there's several books, a number of books you can read about this period of librarian house principle. John has I don't know how much reading you all have done. But anyway, go ahead. Do we have a camp? Do we have any questions? Don't hesitate. There's no such thing as a stupid